Hello and welcome. Thank you all very much for joining us for this afternoon's webinar. My name is Jeremy Torney. I am Chair of Future Earth Ireland and an Associate Professor at the School of Law and Government in Dublin City University. Future Earth is a global network of scientists, researchers and innovators that aims to provide the knowledge needed to support transformation towards sustainability. Future Earth Ireland, convened by the Royal Irish Academy, is the National Committee of Future Earth and is composed of members from a diverse range of academic disciplines, as well as from industry and policymaking. Today's webinar is the third and final in a series of three webinars uh, co-hosted by Future Earth Ireland this spring on the theme, How Can Higher Education Build Forward Better? Across these three webinars, we are exploring how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected our perception of what changes in society are feasible and what this radically changed landscape means for how higher education institutions on the island of Ireland and beyond can contribute to the transition to a sustainable future. Today, we are focusing on teaching and learning. We in Future Earth Ireland are very grateful to the Environmental Research Institute at UCC for co-hosting today's webinar. Dr. Marguerite Nyan of UCC is a member of the Future Earth Ireland Committee and will be chairing today's webinar. Thank you also to Paul Bolger, Aoife Corcoran and Anna Glavin of the UCC Environmental Research Institute uh, and Jennifer Keneally of the Royal Irish Academy for their work to organize today's webinar. Finally, if you are tweeting about today's webinar, please use the hashtag HEBuildForwardBetter. With that, I will hand over to our chair for today's webinar, Dr. E Dr. Marguerite Nyan. Great, thank you very much, Dermot. And good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us for this third and last webinar in the How Can Higher Education Build Forward Better series. And today we are focused on teaching and learning. As Dermot said, my name is Marguerite Nyhan and I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Engineering and Architecture at UCC and I lead a research group at the Environmental Research Institute and the Marai Centre for Energy, Climate and Marine. And I'd like to thank the Environmental Research Institute for co-hosting this webinar with Future Earth Ireland today. In our webinar, we are going to be discussing how to integrate sustainability priorities into third level education. We will discuss what higher education can do in terms of teaching and learning to contribute to a more sustainable post-COVID future and how we can maximise that contribution by fostering an innovative and interdisciplinary educational ecosystem through engagement with research, policy and wider society. I'd like to start by welcoming our panel members and thank them very much indeed for joining us. So welcome to Professor Sarah Cullity, who is joining us from University College Cork, who brings a very unique perspective as both head of the College of Science, Engineering and Food Science and director of the Environmental Research Institute. Welcome to Michelle O'Dowd, who is the Sustainability Officer and joins us from the National University of Ireland in Galway. Welcome to Professor Kerry Fasser, who joins us from the University of Bristol, where she is Professor of Educational and Social Futures. She is an expert on the role of education in developing, in developing pathways towards a sustainable future. And welcome to Aoife Cannon, who is the Education Programme Executive at the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland and has led many initiatives with primary and secondary level education. And finally, welcome to Julian Nagy, who is Vice President for Education for the Maynooth University Students Union and brings a very important student perspective to our discussion today. I'm going to start by asking each panellist to speak in response to a particular broad question which relates to their own expertise of working in and with higher education and following that we will have a wider panel discussion before opening up to questions from the audience and please relay your questions to us via the chat function. So I'd like to start by introducing Professor Sarah Cullity. Sarah is head of the College of Science and Science, Engineering and Food Science and Director of the Environmental Research Institute at UCC. As Head of College, Sarah is committed to ensuring that sustainability is a key component of all programmes. 
As a global expert with multiple collaborations worldwide, Sarah's research expertise is on health and disease in the, in the marine environment, and more recently on the impact of climate change on aquaculture and fisheries. She has served on a number of national and EU advisory boards, and her research has informed international legislation. Professor Colletti is a governor of Photo Wildlife Park, a board member of the Irish Aquaculture Technology and Innovation Platform, and a member of international scientific advisory boards, including at the Centre for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Science in the UK. So, Sarah, from your perspective, what is the role of universities and higher education in addressing the environmental sustainability and climate challenges of our time? And more recently, how has COVID-19 transformed this role? Thanks very much, Marguerite, and it's absolutely lovely to be here today and part of this panel. I suppose I would see the university and higher education um, having a fundamental role in, in actually supporting this strategy. And when we think about what universities do, um, embedding teaching and research um, uh, across the, the ecosystem within the university and our external engagement, there are a few fundamental aspects, I think, that can really help to drive um, change and, and with universities at the center of this. And I suppose initially I would say the first thing is that we have to see ourselves as very much focused on solutions. I think. People have been very overwhelmed by the whole concept of what sustainability is and how they play a role. And I think for us as universities and, and higher education institutes, we have to lead out on being solution focused and showing that there are actually solutions and very much focusing on the role of the individual as well as, as larger um, organizations in having a role to play in this. So for me, within the, within the university, and particularly from my experience in UCC, I would say there are fundamental aspects that we can work on uh, through our teaching, through our research, but also the whole ecosystem that we actually develop on the, the campus. And I think it's really important um, in our third level institutions and in our higher education institutions that we have a co whole culture and ethos that supports the role of every individual on the campus and everyone who is part of our, our um, institutions in playing an individual role. So for me, it's really um, fundamental that there is that culture at the university level. And I suppose we're lucky in UCC, you need that advocacy right down from senior management level, right down to the organization. I think there's a piece to be done for all of us around how every staff member can have some ownership around this issue. And I suppose we have had a situation where there have been some traditional disciplines, particularly in the STEM area, for instance, where there's very clear you know, understanding of how we play a role in this, but actually it's a much bigger issue. And for this to work really well, we need all the disciplines working together. And that's, I think, I suppose, again, you know, the Environmental Research Institute at UCC, it's really been focused on how we bring disciplines together uh, to work on these um, to work on these key challenges, but also to look at how we might bring multidisciplinary aspects to our programs. And I think that's a really important aspect of it as well, because I think the big issue is how we ensure that every discipline can see how they can role, play a key role in this and often that might be a little bit more challenging around, around outside of the traditional STEM um, disciplines. But there is a role for every discipline in this. And I think when we've got that piece, then it is how we translate that to our student body, who are incredibly strong advocates um, right across the university and who want to play their part. And I think if we have disciplines and if we have staff that can identify for our students how they can engage and be part of, of the solution, irrespective of the discipline they're in, then that is a really key part. I think the second part of it is how we, how we engage externally. I think we need to be better at explaining what we do in universities and how we can be part of the solution. And I think a really key success uh, for us has been in terms of partnering with communities, with organizations. I think rather than focusing on on just what we can bring to it. It is really about asking 
you know, communities, organizations. What, what is the type of future? How do they want to, how do they want to shape what sustainability means to them? How we can focus on these key challenges and how we can bring solutions to that as well. And I think then, you know, in terms of COVID, I think um, it's, it's brought challenges and opportunities. Um, I think people have been obviously very focused on the health aspects over the last few years. We were, we were gaining a lot of traction on this whole uh, debate at a national level. I think it's, it's still fundamental, but people are a little bit distracted maybe in certain um, situations. Um, but also it's an opportunity for us to show that there's some of the challenges that we've experienced over the last few years are actually as a result of some of the anthropogenic um, impacts of what we're doing. And that really, if we focus on, you know, a different way of us all living and, and doing our business into the future, that we can bring more widespread solutions to some of these key challenges. So I think there's a whole range of, um, of opportunities to produce a whole generation of students who are very, very engaged and who can be part of the, the solution for the future, but also fundamentally in, in universities and third level in pushing into the national debate and discussion and also partnering, I think, right across the ecosystem as well. Great, thank you very much, Sarah. Really interesting perspective there. So next I'm going to introduce Michelle O'Dowd-Lohan and Michelle is NUI Galway's inaugural sustainability officer. Appointed in 2019 to this senior leadership position, Michelle supports the deputy president and register to further the aims of NUI Galway's community and university sustainability partnership. Michelle previously worked as a sustainability research associate with the Ryan Institute and her research interests include sustainability relating to the education and health sectors. Prior to her time at NUI Galway, Michelle worked for 12 years as the environmental and waste management coordinator with the health service executive. So thanks for joining us, Michelle. Would you like to comment on how we can foster sustainability education within our universities and higher education institute campuses and do this in a sustainable way? Great, thank you very much. Dihuiver fa the Gismila Boyakis as often Cheshin to a large sleep and shunyo, and Shani Kudo Lohan is Anam Don Magus Ibi Marin Ifiko in one oy off and show you gal. Hello everyone, and thanks for the wonderful opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, I'm going to speak about the environmental sustainability of teaching and learning. Uh, I'm going to draw on our experiences at NUI Galway and also provide a European perspective on the content. Uh, NUI Galway was a member of a European Universities Association thematic peer group looking at the environmental sustainability of teaching and learning over the last year. So I'm going to share some of those findings with you today. So through teaching and learning activities, universities can play a leading role in developing the next generation of students, researchers and innovators for tackling society's evolving sustainable development challenges. But to effectively incorporate sustainability into the education agenda, sustainability must be acknowledged as a framework for all education activity. Sustainability principles can be embedded within the academic curriculum in a number of ways by developing new sustainability focused modules and programs, integrating sustainability content into existing courses, increasing the extent of sustainability learning outcomes in academic programs, and integrating sustainability values into student graduate attributes. Concepts of sustainability need to be incorporated broadly into courses so that students view sustainability in a holistic way from environmental, social, and economic perspectives. But often the real challenge for higher education is to identify ways to integrate sustainability into education programs across the board for all students and not just for those students who choose to ch subjects that directly relate to sustainability. I think it's important to say that we need to go beyond the formal curriculum and embed sustainability through extracurricular or non-curricular contexts. For example, can sustainability become part of student recruitment, orientation, clubs and societies, volunteering and life on campus. Can you use the campus as a living lab? This is a great way for students to apply sustainability practices learned in the classroom for real life experience. 
The management of the university and its facilities should reflect sustainability principles, for example, from enhancing biodiversity, conserving energy and promoting the circular economy. And by doing this, the university can serve as a living lab to enable students to learn about sustainability outside the formal curriculum. However, to comprehensively incorporate the sustainability agenda into teaching and learning, we cannot be confined to the sustainability remit of the institution or to the student cohort. Sustainability principles need to be extended to encompass a university-wide holistic approach, engaging not only students, but students, staff and partners in all areas of activity, including teaching and learning, yes, but also research, organisation and governance, culture, operations, engagement activities. Sustainability as a value must be at the heart of all institution activity. And this approach is needed to achieve an authentic delivery of sustainability in higher education institutions. And this is borne out in initiatives at the global level that are seeking to celebrate and advance the critical role that education has in delivering the sustainable development goals. For example, the SDG Accord calls upon world universities to recognize that as educators, we have a responsibility to play a central and transformational role in attaining the SDGs. And to do this, we must align all major efforts with the SDGs, targets, goals and indicators, including through our education, our research, our leadership, our operation and engagement activities. And this is a really big vision. How do we achieve this? How do we ensure the environment and sustainability of teaching and learning? There is no easy answer to this. It is a combination of high commitment, adequate resources, leadership and system-wide engagement. Firstly, the institution needs to establish a common cause throughout its activities. For example, does sustainability align strongly with the institution's identity and purpose? Are sustainability principles embedded in its strategies, policies, procedures at all levels throughout the institution? Sustainability as a value must be at the heart of the institution's activities. But it's important to say that commitment is not enough. Commitment must be supported by adequate resources. And resources can include its people, its funding, its physical infrastructure. We need permanent structures to support teaching and learning sustainability. For example, staff roles in sustainability, staff development programs, formal education and extracurricular programs. Also embedding sustainability requires leadership and system-wide engagement. Strong, visible leadership at all levels is needed. Allowing space for engagement and encouraging active participation in the change process by all stakeholders. A bottom-up approach, student voice, action, activism, matched by top-down leadership. So as I come to the end of my pitch, uh, I'm going to end on a positive note. Hopefully a post-COVID world is just around the corner. And isn't this a wonderful opportunity for transformative leaders to emerge in higher education and build back better, a future where sustainability is at the core of our teaching and learning. Mina Boekes, and I look forward to discussing this and more in the panel discussion in a little while. Thank you. Sure, Margaret. Michelle, thank you very much um, indeed. And great to hear about all the initiatives and all the work you're pioneering at NUI Galway. So next, I'd like to invite Professor Kerry Facer to comment. And Kerry joins us from the University of Bristol, where she is Professor of Educational and Social Futures. And she is based in the School of Education, the Centre for Comparative and International Research in Education, and the Cabot Institute for the Environment. Kerry's pioneering research and expertise is on understanding how to create the conditions for ecologically sustainable and socially just futures and in developing the roles of education in these processes. Kerry is a global expert on the development of more democratic, critical and participatory processes for imagining and negotiating routes to sustainable futures. So Kerry, much of your work has focused on the relationship between people and the planet and on the post-human, which recognizes that humanity, technology and non-human nature are becoming increasingly in interdependent and interlinked. Would you like to comment on that? And furthermore, how does this inform your approach to integrating sustainability priorities into student-centered educational programs for the future? 
Thanks ever so much for that question. And and, um, and thanks for the invitation to, to be part of this conversation. Um, I'll, I'll start by saying I basically agree with everything that Sarah and Michelle have just said, so that's that's all good. Um, and I think also the thing that really comes to mind in terms of what they've just said is, is really this commitment to practice what we preach for us in universities to, um, to not simply just be telling everybody else and our students what to do, but to be thinking about how that then impacts our own work and our own practice. So, um, when I was thinking about this session and thinking about what it felt important to say, it, it feels to me that, that what really matters is to, to understand the diagnosis of the problem that we think we're dealing with here. So when we're thinking about sustainability, what do we think is causing unsustainability? What do we think we're, if you like, up against? And, and to me, there are four levels to that. And I want to talk those through and then explain how I get from those to this idea that we need to work on rethinking our idea of who the student is at the heart of the university endeavor. So the first definition of what unsustainable behavior is, is a geophysical one. So this idea that we are facing a problem of carbon emissions, a problem of biodiversity. It's a science and technology led definition. It's the one that's, that's dominated public debate for 20 odd years. And the implications of that is that education for sustainability focus on, for example, giving information about the cause of the problem, developing carbon literacy, nature education and so forth, all right? So that's, that's one definition. A second definition that we've started seeing really growing in, um, in prevalence, particularly over the last five years, is the political and economic critique um, that says that it's actually political structures and economic structures that are pushing us towards unsustainability. Now, if you adopt that perspective, then you're gonna start saying, well, we need to bring in the social sciences, political theory. We're also going to need to be teaching about climate justice. We're going to need to be teaching about the history and the causes of this situation. The third definition is one um, that is growing um, significantly alongside the decolonization movement, which says that the causes of unsustainability are actually problems of modernity, of post enlightenment thinking, of industrial ways of living and organizing our world. And that, that central to that is a problem of knowledge, um, what de Souza Santos calls um, epistemological monocultures, the idea that there is only one way of thinking about things. Um, and that that ties with um, the interconnection between universities and colonial projects for the last four or five hundred years. And so from that we get an educational agenda that says we need to think about interdisciplinarity, we need to think about decolonization of knowledge, and we need to think about epistemological pluralism. All right. So we've got those three levels that are, that are uh, swirling around us at the moment in terms of defining the problem. So it's a biophysical one, it's a political and economic one, it's a problem of knowledge. The fourth definition that I think doesn't get as much attention as it should is an ontological one. So the problem of unsustainability is to do with the dominant relationship between ourselves and the world. That it's a sense that humans are separate from the planet. And from this, we need an educational agenda that says we new, need new ways of thinking about, well, what does it mean to be human? <laughs> now, this really matters to me because if we don't think this through, we end up with situations where, um, for example, I'm teaching students about climate change and I get a message from one of my students sitting in an international airport saying, I'm not going to be able to write my essay on sustainability because I've got a 40 hour flight to catch. OK, so in that sort of worldview, we have a sense of um, you learn about sustainability, but it's not actually necessarily impacting on you. It's not part of your life. It's not something that's integrated with you. So the critical thing that I think if we're going to shift towards education for sustainability is a fundamental rethink of who we think the human is at the heart of education. And for the last 50 years, we have been dominated by this idea of kind of homo economicus. We're educating our individual students, our rational autonomous individuals to take a place in the market, all right? So this idea that we're trying to educate people for uh, just simply the world of employment. That makes no sense at all. It's not intellectually coherent. It's not ethically coherent. It doesn't make any sense in terms of sustainability. 
So for me, we need a different sense of who the human is. And this is a human that is entangled. It's entangled with each other, with other people. Our success is not just us as an individual. It's, <coughs> excuse me, deeply entangled with the technologies that we're using. We are not separate from these machines and tools and resources, and it's entangled with the planet. So we need to think about how we create an educational practice that appeals to our students, that speaks to our students, knowing that they are entangled with all of these different attributes. So what might this mean pedagogically? Well, I think it means that whatever discipline, discipline or area that we're working in, we want to be tracing these entanglements and dependencies, not trying to nurture this crazy idea of the rational autonomous individual. We want people to understand what they are interconnected with and dependent on. We want them to be mapping them. We want to be exploring the differences in these. And to do this requires some experimentation. We need different pedagogical approaches. We need to, playing, to play really with, uh, with different ways in which we might be thinking. And we can turn to other traditions as well that might be able to provide us with some insights. The practices um, associated with indigenous knowledge traditions from various parts of the world, for example, are beginning to point out what it might mean to live and to learn as though one is part of the planet. Um, so I want to finish with a practical thought experiment. How might we recognize ourselves as entangled with others? And I'm really interested in the rituals that we use um, on a day-to-day -day basis to, if you like, either tell ourselves stories of our own specialness and autonomy and independence or our interconnection. So think about the simple practice of, of saying thank you when we, when we eat some food, okay? Who do we say thank you to and why? Would it be possible to start saying thank you uh, not only to somebody for having provided this for us, but actually to all the humans, all the animals, all the world that it took to be able to put food on our table. That on a day-to-day -day basis is one way of making that visible. And I'd like to see that in universities when we think about our graduation process. Can you imagine a graduation ritual or routine that doesn't simply involve an individual going up on their own, being given a single certificate and wearing a hat, but an individual somehow displaying all of the people, the material, the the plants, the humans, the technologies and everything else that it took to get them there. And that sort of shift in our thinking, shift in our rituals, I think would make visible this different idea of the human at the heart of the educational experience. It would also be really good as well for a little bit of modesty. And I think modesty is the other issue that we need to try to be able to cultivate uh, in the current time. So uh, yeah, I think I'll finish at that point. Thanks, Marguerite. That's great. Uh, thank you very much, Kerry. And it's yeah, wonderful to hear your perspective there on, you know, on the relationship between humans, you know, with non-human nature and technology and our place in the world. And it's really fascinating to, to, to hear your insights on your work. So next, I'd like to welcome Aoife Cannon. And Aoife is the Education Programme Executive at the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. Aoife is responsible for developing an initiative which teaches children about saving energy at home and at school, sustainability in their lives and climate change. Aoife holds a degree in Business Studies and Languages and a Certificate in Environmental Education. She's a founding member of Baldoyle Tidy Towns and has a major focus on biodiversity and sustainability. So Aoife, Excuse me. Aoife, <clears throat> much of your work involves running workshops on sustainability with primary and secondary school students, as well as providing training and support for teachers. So what do you think are the main challenges in mainstreaming sustainability in education at these levels and how can they be overcome? Thanks, Marguerite, and um, thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, it's really interesting listening to the other speakers. Um, so I suppose thinking about my question and the challenges we face um, to make sustainability mainstream in primary and post-primary education, um, I felt that the best way to answer is to describe our experiences in schools. Um, just to, to give you a picture, um, before the pandemic, um, we would have had on average um, reached about 25,000 children per year and about a thousand teachers with our in-school workshops on sustainable energy and climate change. So we have a good idea what goes on in schools. 
Um, so if I could ask you all just to have a picture in your mind of a typical Irish primary school. Um, there uh, tends to be a green flag um, hanging at the front of the school. Um, the fourth class teacher, we'll say, is the Green Schools Coordinator. We'll refer to her as Miss Kelly. And Miss Kelly is passionate about the environment and works hard to ensure that her school is active in Green Schools, the Green Schools programme. But she finds it difficult to get everyone on board. And just last year, Miss Kelly say, and her pupils on the Green Schools Committee planted a lovely wildflower patch only for the school caretaker to spray them, telling her afterwards that he'd helped her and he'd got rid of the weeds. At least once a week, Miss Kelly um, tries to bring her uh, teaching outdoors with her pupils, obviously, because she's really keen to instill a connection to nature in her pupils. And although she encourages her fellow teaching colleagues uh, to go outside, very few of them actually do. Um, the school got recycle and compost bins for all the classrooms and staff room. And Miss Kelly frequently reminds staff about bins, but the usual response she gets is, Ash, we don't have time for that. She mentioned at a, a, meet, a recent staff meeting that the school will be moving onto the marine theme for the Green Schools programme the following year, academic year, only to be told that the school would be taking a break from the environmental work and choosing a different activity. So for the most part, that's, that's the picture we get of um, our facilitators, the, the, the facilitators, it, that's their experience of sustainability in schools. It is seen as optional, it's not core. And Miss Kelly, she's the ecotype, and so it's left to her. So what I've done is I've given you an example of a primary school, but this also applies to post-primary uh, in our experience. So I suppose the challenge there is how to ensure the whole school, the children from junior infants aged five all the way up to the sixth years uh, aged about 18, the teachers, the principal, the deputy principal, secretary, board of management and the caretaker are all actively part of being a sustainable school and that the environment is not something to opt in and out or out of. It is core. And I think Michelle referred to the holistic approach and that's really what I'm talking about as well. So then how do we overcome this challenge? Well, Miss Kelly, who we spoke about, who I mentioned earlier and other champion teachers, we've referred to her as a champion teacher. They will look outside the curriculum and the textbooks for their teaching. But most teachers, due to a loaded curriculum, and I don't blame them, will stick predominantly to the textbooks. And the textbooks are informed by the curriculum, which the curriculum in Ireland is decided by the NCCA. So the NCCA go out to public cons consultation whenever they're updating or reviewing the curriculum and they encourage and invite everyone, teachers, parents, organisations, everyone to make submissions, to have their voices heard. So we feel by inf influencing the curriculum, not only do we have an impact on what is taught in schools and at colleges of initial teacher education, but also school infra infrastructure design, so including the grounds. So for example, if five hours of teaching outdoors is on the curriculum, then it's highly likely that an outdoor classroom will be included in the grounds, in the design of the grounds. So last year, the primary curriculum went out to consultation. And again, there'll be more consultation for the next academic year. Uh, the senior cycle went out to consultation in 2019. And then a new junior cycle was rolled out in 2015 with sustainability much more at the core of it. So I suppose I'd, I'd like to summarise by saying like the overcoming the challenge of making sustainability mainstream in primary and post-primary education is to ensure that sustainability is integrated across all subjects, all activities, all teachings. In short, it has to be embedded in the ethos of all schools. 
Thank you very much, Aoife. That's brilliant. Um, so I'd like to finish this first round of questions and answers with Mr. Julian Nagy. And Julian is the Vice President for Education in Maynooth Students Union, which is the representative body of the students of both Maynooth University and St. Patrick's College. In his role as VP for Education, Julian acts as the Chief Spokesperson on issues of academic interest for members of the Students Union. In his time as VP, he has worked on developing the provision of course content related to environmental sustainability and has focused on new undergraduate electives. So Julian, as Vice President for Education with Maynooth's Students Union, you've worked to include more content on environmental sustainability in curriculums. Can you firstly tell us about this work and more broadly it would be very interesting to hear your views on how well Irish, Irish universities are actually doing in terms of providing our students with the education, the skills and the knowledge that they need for the future. Uh, market, uh, Marguerite, so it's a huge honour to speak here today. Um, so I, I, I think I should start by actually giving a bit of background how my interest in the work of um, in the interest of um, in the environment sustainability in Minute came around. So I've always been someone who is uh, who's been very environmentally conscious. And when I was running for the position of vice president of education in the union, I decided that I needed something around environment sustainability in my in my manifesto. So I spoke to a lot of people, and some of them were giving great uh, feedback around uh, their education in Minute, you know, you know, in Minute around environment sustainability. In all fairness, we are the university that brought um, the likes of Peter Thorne and John Sweeney, two very, very um, good uh, climatologists abroad. But there was a minority who, uh, who had a very different feedback. And I realized that we're, we had some departments that were doing an absolutely amazing work in the field of uh, teaching around environmental sustainability and including it throughout the curriculum. But then there were others who weren't doing so well. And of course, the, um, and um, I figured that if I get elected, I have a year to get some work on it. So what I looked at is um, having, obviously there was a larger piece of work in tackling the department, you know, in trying to encourage the departments that weren't doing so well to include more in the curriculum. But I felt that I needed something that could be done in the year. So I thought, how about we, I try and, you know, capitalize on the departments that are doing well and try and get more of them to provide electives that are, which are basically uh, modules that are outside of your field of study that you can take instead of a module within your home department. So say if you're a um, French and German student, you could take, instead of one of your German modules, you could take um, a module in geography and then climate change or something. So that's something that I started working for the year on the uh, from since the start of the year. So I approached the departments, I spoke to them about the you know why this is valuable for them and of course for the students as well. Though of course you have to target the audience of with what you talk about. Um, and I actually did to support uh, the need for this. I did a poll on the university on the students' unions Instagram, and the results were that most students did value think it was very valuable and that about 80% of the students were getting a very good experience, but the other 20 weren't. And in a university of 14,000 students, that accounts for, you know, that's nearly 3,000 students who weren't getting that top level. So I thought, you know, we do need to uh, tackle this. Um, and then that actually brought about a wider discussion around environment sustainability within the university. And I am very lucky. I'm not sure if every student senior officer in the country can say the same and that the management in Minute University is very um, open to working with the Students' Union and I received great support from the likes of the University Re Registrar and the Dean of Teaching and Learning. Um, so there was, a, uh, there was a wider piece of work around identifying what where we're doing very well in terms of environment sustainability and where we aren't uh, in the point, from the point of view of having a wider review. And from the point of view of why this is important and how the universities are doing, um, I think there is a bit of a framework that's required, um, you know, say for, uh, in, the ter in terms of quality reviews. When we're doing quality reviews for different programs or different departments, uh, you know, what they're teaching, I think there should be, you know, a separate category for, you know, there should be, every one of them should look at 
how well we're teaching environment sustainability because it is a very important thing. If you look at it, um, students are talking about it all the time. There is an amazing student engagement in initiatives such as um, such as uh, the Fridays for Future protests. We had at one stage 100 students going on a Friday afternoon um, to the square at the main square in Minute to pro you know to take part in the protest alongside the primary and secondary students, uh, which is amazing given that we're a commuter college and come 1 p.m. on a Friday afternoon, everyone's trying to get out. Um, so there was a huge uh, interest in this. For, um, and I think it's a very big opportunity for the universities as well, since this is one of the main, um, main you know, main points of view for our main interest for the many is so many students and so many prospective students, a university that puts environmental sustainability education into the heart of everything that it does. It would be a very strong unique selling point for such institution. Um, it would look good from the point of view of employability rankings and so on. I would love if I didn't have to talk about this and it was very clear that, you know, regardless of employability, regardless of, you know, recruitment targets, this is just a very important issue. But for, you know, I think we need to, in order to try and drive environment sustainability in the curriculum, you know, we need to hit it at every angle. We need to give every argument that we can get. And it is so important for the future of our planet. Um, because if we don't teach about this, we're left with, you know, people in decision-making positions, as much as I don't like it, people who go to university make up a majority of the decision-makers we're left with, for example, the Sounds Bypass, which is a over 100 million euro project that got recently completed. And um, there's barely any cycle infrastructure. It's very poorly designed, what is there. And the question is, you know, of course, the en engineers who are in charge of the design should have known this, but the decision makers who study politics or whatever, the journalists who are covering the topic should have known as well. So it's just so important and I think we need to do more about it. That's great. Thank you very much, Julian. Um, it's great to hear about your experiences and indeed to hear that there's such engagement on sustainability from the student population in, in Maynooth and St. Patrick's College. So that's brilliant. Thank you. So after those initial perspectives, uh, we're now going to proceed into a short format panel discussion and we, we have a series of questions for the panelists. So in continuing on, we, we've touched on the role that higher education can play in helping to build forward better after COVID, but is there a role for universities in a just transition? And I might start with Ke Kerry, if you wouldn't mind commenting on that question, please. Start with the easy one. Yes, um, I think the, the critical issues, we need to recognize that a lot of universities are, well, that higher education in general at the moment risks reproducing inequalities. And if we're talking about a just transition, we're not talking about shifting simply to a more um, environmentally sustainable um, world. We're talking about a shift towards a more economically, socially just, a more inclusive, more diverse world. So critically, universities need to be thinking about who is it that they are educating. Um, if we're looking at the sort of rapid decarbonisation that we're going to need over the next 10 years, for example, we're going to be asking large numbers of people to change their work, change their livelihoods, shift what it is they do. At this point, I would like to see across the world significant government support for these students to be able to participate in university educational experiences to begin to develop new ways of living and learning and working so that they so that there are not a whole load of people that are going to lose out. And frankly, if we don't do that, then um, there's going to be significant opposition to any changes. So that's just one really small example, but I'm sure my colleagues have got other, other things that they would suggest as well, so I'll shut up. <laughs> Thanks, Kerry. That's great, really interesting. And would anyone else like to comment on that? Okay, so we'll move on from that. Um, so the next question would be, would be the following and in terms of approaching um, approaches to integrating uh, sustainability priorities into programs and curricula what has been tried by Irish higher education institutes and what have we learned so far so we might go to Michelle to provide some insights on that first. Uh, great Margaret and thanks for the opportunity to answer this um, I suppose the first thing I would say is regardless of the approach that you take 
a strategic institutional commitment is really important so that the commitment there is at an institutional level. So just in terms of an example at NUI Galway, um, we recently launched our strategic plan for the university and that plan is based on four core values. So sustainability is one of our four core values. That means it's a key pillar of the plan with 10 flagship actions across the university mission. And the language very much in that plan is around equipping students with knowledge and skills to become sustainability role models and leaders. So that's there at the institutional level. In terms of an approach, really, I suppose the approach that we're using at NUI Goa is this idea of a learn, live, lead model. And really what that means is that we're trying to embed learning about sustainability into all aspects of our teaching and learning so that everyone that comes to campus to NUI Goa, they learn about sustainability. Then aligned to that, we're trying to set the campus up that we live more sustainably in everything that we do. You know, the food that we eat, the energy we use, how we manage our waste, how we promote health and wellbeing. I suppose the idea is because we're learning about it and we're living it, that that should position us then to be the role models and leaders in terms of translating that sustainability agenda out into the wider world. So in terms of the learn part of that, then we have a working group specifically looking at this whole area of research and learning. And when it comes to teaching and learning and sustainability, you know, what we're trying to do is, I suppose, map firstly, and then increase sustainability content within the curriculum and develop a network of sustainability curriculum champions that will work with module owners and program directors to review learning objectives and align content to sustainability. But I suppose we also put a very strong emphasis not only through the form of curriculum, but also through, you know, co-curricular opportunities in sustainability and hidden curricular opportunities. So with co-curricular, you know, that's about embedding sustainability across the entire student experience. That means, you know, student recruitment, orientation, clubs and societies, life on campus. And then I suppose the hidden curriculum, how we set the campus up, the students inevitably learn about sustainability. And that's having things like a sustainable event checklist, a bike share scheme, a levy on a single use cup, a dashboard coming into buildings showing how much you know, energy or water that building uses. So hidden ways for students to inevitably learn about, about sustainability. So I, I leave it at that, um, Marguerite, but that's just some perspectives from any I go. And I suppose we very much see sustainability as a process rather than an in point in itself. So I'm not setting us out to be you know, ahead of anyone else, but that's just some examples in terms of how we're approaching it. Brilliant. Great to hear about all of that work at NUI Galway. And I really love how you how you mentioned the learn, live and lead um, model and your integrating sustainability into the entire student experience and staff experience as well. That's absolutely brilliant. So I'd like to talk a little bit about interdisciplinarity and which many of you have mentioned already. And firstly, you know, why is it important to bring the disciplines together in the context of sustainability and then if it is important how can this be best built into sustainability education and can we foster cross-disciplinary collaboration I might ask Sarah on her perspective on this please thanks Marguerite um, yeah I think this is this is a fundamental issue actually because we know that sustainability is multifaceted um, there's the environmental component, but really it's a case of, you know, you do need to get disciplines working together to be really able to provide cohesive um, and coherent uh, responses and solutions to, to some of those key challenges in this area. Um, when, when I think of this, I suppose actually a lot of the time our structures in the universities don't actually help this. We, we fundamentally often sit within a discipline. Um, it is often, you know, much of the activity sits within that discipline and really what we need to be doing then is work outside of those formal structures that we have in the universities and work across disciplines. That actually takes a bit of, of energy and, and a little bit of thinking outside the box and um, it can be even more fundamentally challenging when you go across the, the facet of disciplines in a whole university and you try and bring people together. And I think, um, you know, a fundamental way of doing this, and I think this is what we've been doing at UCC, is, is bringing people together through research. And that actually also opens up the opportunities for teaching and ensuring that we have our research informed curriculum that can fundamentally bring sustainability into it. So I think when you, when you provide a fora, um, as we've done, to bring discipline, different disciplines together, different individuals with very, very different perspectives, 
coming from very different areas together to look at a key issue around sustainability, we see the complementarity of what people can do and actually how you do get that big, much more coherent response to those, those fundamental issues. And when you get people starting to work like this, you start to get them talking about how they might look at, you know, bringing that into their teaching that can go into the individual disciplines. But also then I think thinking about how can we bring different disciplines together, you know, and sustainability is one of those key areas where you really can teach sustainability in one discipline. You absolutely need all the disciplines coming together. So things then like um, university-wide modules and university-wide programs. And it probably takes a little bit more effort and then also providing for it for students from different disciplines to come together. And we've had different activities as all the universities have to bring students together to look at some of those key challenges. And it's when you get people together, you realize, um, you know, people can actually see the value in working outside of their own discipline. It takes a lot of effort, but it, it's much more worthwhile and it's, much, it's a lot more fun too. Absolutely. And it's important to focus on those challenges and, and to kind of bring the, the disciplines together to work towards building those, you know, the solutions or providing the education for the students that they can work on those challenges um, in understanding the challenges and devising solutions for the problems that we're encountering now and, and in the future. So I suppose in, in a way, you know, the concept of disciplines is, is, is sort of being challenged and the structures of, of universities are, are being challenged in, in a way in what we're saying. But um, Kerry, I might ask you to pick up here, if you don't mind, you know, from your perspective, is there a value to disciplines in sustainability education? Um, yeah, so I think I think one of the risks, um, so I, I'm a, a big advocate and big fan for everything that um, Sarah, amongst others, have been saying about the, the importance of interdisciplinarity. Um, but I think it's also worth remembering what different disciplines give us, particularly in terms of how they enable us to think about the future. So I think it is precisely about understanding the different things that these groups can, different disciplines can bring. Um, so for example, if we think about engineers, quite often their idea of the future is, look, we can build it, we've got solutions, okay? So this is, this is useful, but it's really dangerous if it happens without an awareness of what we might lose, what our, our responsibilities might be for stewardship. So at that point, you might think about the disciplines of biology or biosciences or even classics as thinking about how do we steward what we've got now into the future so that it can last. But that is really useful, useless on its own if it doesn't take account of, for example, what we know from sociology and other critical traditions that are about saying, look, we need a critical orientation to the future. Um, and finally, none of those are any good unless you've got the modeling orientation to the future. So climate science, whether it's drama, whatever else it is, which is about saying, how do we imagine the future? So for me, it's, it's really useful to understand what it is that different disciplines can bring. And to me, what they offer is different orientations to the future that we need to be able to move around them we need to stop having sociologists who can critique other people's ideas of the future but can't make anything engineers who will build stuff but don't know how to look after things um, you know scientists who will experiment but don't know how to imagine different worlds you know this is the point we need these different pieces but we in order to do that and for it not to just flatten out, which it can do sometimes when we teach sustainability, it can flatten out into this idea that it's all the same thing and everybody learns the same thing. We want to bring this sort of diversity because one of the key features of a sustainable landscape and a sustainable world is that we've got difference and that we value difference and we understand how to put it into dialogue with each other. Brilliant, great. And Julian, would you like to give a student perspective on that? Do you think that it's, it's a, a, as a student, would you like to see more educational offerings, you know, that go right across universities that incorporate more disciplines, that you've more, more choice in what you, what you study? What, what do you think? Well, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Absolutely. I agree. Um, I think the previous speakers have to, um, spoke about it very well. Uh, in the sense that what uh, that I think that especially the point that was very being made that for all the advantages of grouping, you know, academic staff members into specific disciplines, it nearly 
limits what can be taught in terms of as well as that uh, what's advertised in the different CEO courses and so on. Um, trying to strive to include different outlooks and different uh, perspectives into uh, you know into everyone's course so that a geography graduate does not you know does not come out of university with only a geographic output on things and views things only from a spatial perspective same way as you said about engineers and so on i think it is very important and wherever i've seen it come to play the um, you know the challenges were very small such as different you know uh, referencing systems in comparison to the huge benefits that the students reported in terms of the quality of teaching you know broadening their outlook on the subject that they were studying in the first place um so that's yeah, absolutely brilliant and i think for many things it is a huge improvement but for the teaching of environmental sustainability it is by far the most beneficial great thank you and so We've discussed sustainability education within our universities and higher education institutes, but in, in looking beyond our universities, how can higher education be better integrated with other institutions, you know, with policy, government, industry and society to address the sustainability and climate challenges and indeed many other societal challenges that we are encountering today. So in going beyond the university, um, what, what, what do people think about integrating with, uh, with other institutions? So I might bring Sarah back in on, on that one. Sarah, if you'd like to comment. Can we unmute Sarah, please? Ah, got myself. Something happened there. Sorry, couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> Thanks, Marguerite. Yeah, I think um, I think the first um, point I come back to around this is, you know, us as universities and higher education organizations being better able to explain our role and our mission and how we can contribute to this. I think we are we haven't always done this well. We haven't done it in an integrated way. way and we I suppose sometimes we would be seen as the kind of the experts a bit remote and a bit preachy maybe, you know, and really what we need to do is get rid of the jargon and be able to speak, um, you know, with and collaborate with other organisations. Um, and again, I go back to the piece around, um, there's different, we have different stakeholders that ideally we want to, we want to, um, we want to um, work with and, and I suppose collaborate with on this and it might be you know, our funders, our policy makers, the public are really important as well on this. And I suppose, again, then it is, for me, a big issue around this is how we really show that we can provide, um, you know, informed debate, evidence-based, um, you know, that we have, you know, evidence to support what we're talking about, but also that we can focus very much on, you know, key solutions um, and opportunities to get through some of these what people might consider very challenging, you know, perspectives on where we're going as a society. So um, I think it, it is being a little bit more organized in terms of how we, we give our message and how we advocate and how we work with different organizations. And we have a bit of work to do, I think, around that. Great, thank you. And I think very... Kerry, would like to make a comment? Yes, I'd um, completely support what Sarah's just said. Um, one of the most interesting examples of, of this, um, I think, is the Commonwealth Programme, um, which is an approach that recognises that universities are anchor organisations in their local area. Um, and that, that really takes seriously the way in which the university as a financial organisation in a community can start to work to create more sustainable communities around them. So that includes things like looking at how they recruit people, how they buy things, understanding its procurement and transport processes, you know, really working through all of that. But I'm also interested in the fact that universities often have quite large funds in reserve. Well, at least we did until the uh, pandemic hit. But um, 
the, and, and the issue is, is how those funds are used. And we're starting to see really interesting moves in terms of divestment and ethical investing. And I think we have to recognize also that universities have land holdings, many of them. How is that land used? There is absolutely no point in universities promoting their academics talking about climate science, while at the same time sustaining exploitative, extractive, industrial, agricultural, forestry on their own lands. You know, there is a politics to how universities are working and we really, really need to take some responsibility for ourselves in those areas as well. Great. Um, I might bring Aoife back into the conversation as well. Um, Aoife, would you like to comment on how our education systems can work with other organisations, you know, whether it be with industry and enterprise or government related entities like the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland? You know, do we need better mechanisms to make these types of collaborations possible based on your experience? Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose like if, if we look at sustainability and you know bringing real life examples schools at the moment it's difficult for schools to um say get real life examples they're in the classroom for schools for teachers to be able to take um children out of the school say on a tour there's always going to be barriers there and we have to try and work with like lo local industry would like to uh, not just industry but organization environmental um, say community groups or environmental um, uh, centres, I'm thinking of various centres around Ireland, we have a beautiful centre in Galway called Bridget's Garden, which have their own renewable um, garden. And it's ideal to give children real life, hands-on experience of renewables in action. Um, they have various renewables there. Um, some are like solar panels um, giving electricity for their cafe and their, um, their, their offices and, that. and then others are just hands-on play activities. Um, but it's difficult for schools to actually get out there and, and um, visit these places because maybe the, the buses are too expensive, they might not have the funds to, to, to get a bus. Um, so I suppose it's to try and we try at SEAI try and link up schools with local, those sort of local um, supports where children can see the real life activities going on. Um, so I suppose, it, and, and we work within SEAI, we obviously don't just have the schools programme, we have um, a business programme, we have an annual awards uh, scheme called the Energy Awards. And a lot of those winners would like to work and invite schools in to see what is happening. For example, I'll give one example. Last year, our winners on um, renewable innovation were an organisation called Generation Green who do anaerobic digestion. So it's a fantastic um, uh, example of how they use food waste for ana anaerobic digestion, for biofuels, etc. And they would like to have local schools in to see this in action. Obviously, that's really relevant to any student studying um, agricultural science, um, uh, science in general, um, or transition year students who might be doing a module on sustainability. So we try as much as possible to link up that schools with, the, with, with other organisations and industry. So I hope that answers uh, definitely. The question, yeah, ab Margaret. Absolutely great, Aoife. Yeah, no, that for, for students to learn about sustainability and climate action and see it for, you know, see it in the real world. I think that's just so such an important element of the learning and student experience. So that's absolutely great, Aoife. Thank you very much. So I'd like to move on to one uh, last topic, and that's the transformational change that has in, in education that has been brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's been a huge disruption to education. But, you know, maybe we have learned lessons and, you know, what, what have we learned? You know, have we learned, you know, more about remote teaching and learning practices through the pandemic? What are the consequences of us of this moving forward? What's the consequence of this for sustainability education and sustainability transitions? So I'm wondering, would anyone like to comment on this, this topic? Sarah, great. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Margaret. 
Um, yeah, I think um, we've learned an awful lot over the last year. Um, I think we've learned in the first instance that we're actually much more agile and, and you know, as organizations that might have been seen as relatively slow in, in making, you know, big transformational changes that we've actually done that in 12 months. Um, I think there's been some uh, lots of benefits to that and, and there's things that we will keep afterwards. It's also shown us though, the fundamental um, plays that universities have in actually developing our citizens of the future. And I think that's what our students are really missing. Um, and, and also the staff actually, you know, the university is, um, uh, you know, or any of our organizations are fundamentally, they're like little towns where our citizens, you know, get uh, different perspectives from their friends and their colleagues and what they learn on in their classes and what they learn outside of the classes. And we're all missing that social part of being part of uh, a higher education system because we do actually a lot of our learning, all of us staff and students outside of the classroom. And we fundamentally missed that over the last year. But I think our students will see some benefits to some of the remote, you know, and the um, online learning that they've been able to access. We, we certainly like to keep some of that um, afterwards. And I suppose another big part of it is that, you know, we know now that we can provide a more flexible model of, of learning for students. And also there's opportunities for a whole range of other learners that may not have been able to access a full-time university education that may now be able to access, you know, if we have a more flexible model of learning. And that can only be a good thing into the future. So I suppose there are challenges around this completely remote way that we're working at the moment, but there are certainly learnings and positive aspects. But at the same time, I think people, a lot of our students and our staff are really keen to get back into that inclusive um, environment where we can all, you know, work and learn um, from each other on, on the campus. Great, thank you. And and uh, Julian, I might bring you in uh, just to get your perspective on this. You know, how disruptive has COVID nineteen been to your education and your peers? Uh, are you op optimistic about the future of sustainability education for students? Thank you, Margaret. I actually very much so. Um, just from the point of view of um, you know, there was a subset of our students, those mostly from marginalised and you know underrepresented groups in higher education, who've been calling for decades for uh, remote teaching um, and we were constantly told, no, that's impossible, you can't do it. And then suddenly a need arose and in the space of weeks, we were able to do this. And now we're talking about keeping it. The point is, um, we also have been told that for decades that, you know, everyone needs two cars, um, is, you know, in front of their driveway to move around. And the thing is, we haven't done this in the past, but we can go back to that and I think it, just told, I, I thought, I think the one good thing that the pandemic taught us in higher education is how, you know, some, you know, if there is a need for something and if there is a strong, you know, reason to do it, you can achieve wonders. And the point is, you, you just need the pressure, in this case, obviously pressure from environmentally conscious students to create such a thing. Um, though there is probably a bit of worry that the issues that we do see every day that drive us onwards around the environment and sustainability aren't as visible because so many people are spending their most of their days in their bedrooms. Um, but overall, I am very, very optimistic for the future. Great, thank you, Julian. Kerry. So um, I think this is a really interesting question. Um, and I think the critical thing that this last year has taught us is that we can ask the question, why on earth do we do things the way we do them, <laughs> right? You know, really, there is an opportunity to ask fundamental questions. And it really isn't just about online or offline. I mean, we know that face-to-face -face matters. We also know that working dis in a distance fashion allows different sorts of dialogue and different participation. So it's not either or. But this fundamental question of what really matters for university education, what is it for? That to me is the question that we need to be asking. And critically, we need to start creating space for staff and for students to come together to think about that quite slowly in the way that you're doing through this webinar series. Because I also know that huge numbers of staff are exhausted after this year, okay? 
huge numbers of students are really stressed. So what we have to do is create some slower spaces for these conversations. We need to ask much more fundamental questions as well. Is the financial model of the university sustainable? Is continuing to recruit and support academic staff after their PhD on short-term contracts with very little remuneration and no time for research? Is the ongoing relationship between the university and its community sustainable? You know, the distant stuff is interesting, but it's not the most important question we need to ask. So the pandemic has given us the chance to say what matters, what is a university for, particularly in a situation where we've got a pressing ecological crisis. So I would really encourage us to be asking the very, very fundamental questions. Who should go to university? Who should it be funded? What does a core high quality education look like in an era of environmental uh, collapse? Those, those are the questions that I really want us to have a good amount of time to talk about. <laughs> That's great, Kerry. And I think I think that, that would provide the title for our next uh, webinar. As, uh, as we're coming up to time there now, um, we're going to have to end there. So, and I think you made some really salient points. So, th so thank you very much. Um, so I think there are major, or there are a few major takeaways from our discussion today. Um, I think first is the consensus there's some consensus on the need to build and adapt our educational ecosystems to respond to the challenges that we have today and preempt the challenges that we have that we will encounter in the future. And we want to achieve this by fostering new innovations and new ideas within higher education. Another takeaway is the need for more inclusive dialogue and collaboration between the disciplines, between higher education institutes and between academia, industry and society. And we need to work collectively to ensure that higher education is contributing to a sustainable, fair and just society for the benefit of everyone now and for future generations. Um, some of the points that were mentioned, you know, include instilling a culture of sustainability within our universities, supporting students and staff. We need leadership and advocacy. We need to better understand what the unsustainable, um, uh, what, what's unsustainable, as well as focus on the solutions for sustainability. Um, we need to ensure that sustainability is core rather than optional. We need to take a holistic approach and the student voice needs to be central to the discourse around sustainability ability as well. So hopefully that encapsulates some of what we've discussed today. So as, as we're at time, I would like to thank all of our panellists again for contributing to an extremely interesting and stimulating discussion this afternoon. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Before we end, I'd like to reiterate our appreciation for all of those who organised today's event, including the Future Earth Ireland National Committee, and a special thanks to Professor Dermot Torney and Dr Nessa Cronin. I'd like to thank Jennifer Keneally from the Royal Irish Academy and a huge thanks to the Environmental Research Institute at UCC for co-hosting our webinar today. Finally, uh, to all of you at home, uh, thanks to the audience. Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon and engaging with the conversation. So with that, I'll hand you back over to the Chair of Future Earth Ireland, Professor Dermot Torney for some closing remarks for this webinar and webinar series. Thanks, Marguerite, and thank you to all of our panellists for an insightful and stimulating discussion this afternoon. Um, this brings to an end our Future Earth webinar series uh, on how higher education can build forward better. Thank you to everyone who contributed to all three of our webinars uh, across the, the, the series, and um, both our expert contributors uh, and also those who assisted behind the scenes. A special thank you to the three institutes that co-hosted the three webinars. Professor Tasman Crow and his colleagues in the UCD Earth Institute, Samantha Fahi and her colleagues in the DCU Sustainability Office, and Dr. Marguerite Nyan uh, and her colleagues in the UCC Environmental Research Institute. Thank you also to the rest of the Future Earth Ireland National Committee and to Jennifer Keneally in the Royal Irish Academy for their help and support in putting together and running this webinar series. Of course, this should not mark the end of our collective conversation on these important themes. Uh, I hope uh, that we can continue to engage with each other in various contexts in the future in this regard. I hope also that the insights from this webinar series will contribute to the ongoing work of the Higher Education Futures Task Force. 
This task force has been convened by the Royal Irish Academy to explore framework options for the future development of higher education across the island of Ireland and will report in the coming months. We look forward uh, to seeing the outputs of the task force and we hope that sustainability will be at the core of its vision for the future of higher education on the island of Ireland. Last but certainly not least, a big thank you to all of you who have tuned in this afternoon and to the other webinars in this series. I hope that you will continue to engage with the work of Future Earth Ireland. Thank you and goodbye.